Hello, welcome to the Dear Nikki podcast, where I'm going to be giving you personalized user research advice based on your questions or struggles. So let's dive into today's episode. Hello, hello, welcome to the podcast. I'm in a singy voice, day, mood. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I won't sing that much. It's it's a really terrible sound when I sing. Although I do love karaoke, I must say there is something really fun and great about karaoke. Not going to lie. Even if it makes people very upset to listen to me. <laughs> it's like one of those talents that I wish I had, singing and drawing, neither of which I can do with any skill at all whatsoever. Although my husband is very nice and occasionally he's like, you're not that bad at singing, but I am. So love makes you say really weird stuff, apparently. (laughs) Anyways, I hope you're having a great day, whatever day it is for you. Today is Monday for me. If it's also a Monday for you, I hope you're having a fun Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever day you are listening to this podcast episode. I almost called it a wonderful podcast episode, but that feels a little bit weird (laughs) for me to call my own podcast episode wonderful. But hey, you know what? We're going to make it a wonderful episode today. But anyways, I hope that you're having a great day so far or night or everything, all all the things under the sun, the days, the time of day, all, all of the things, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Hope it's awesome. We are hoping to get some better weather this week. Fingers crossed. I am just really wanting to be out in the garden. And it's not easy to do that when you're hovering in a range of like eight degrees Celsius, which is about in the 40s, I want to say, for Fahrenheit. Not exactly fun. But what is fun is this question. Awesome transition, right? Anyways, so let's dive in to today's question. Hi, Nikki. I am a user researcher at a B2B2C SaaS company with no access to end users, so I only do research on the B2B part. Another particularity, a new word for me, I've practiced saying that word about a thousand times, is that we only have 20 customers and we often have to do research with the same customers. Do you have any research best practices to share with me in this context? And how can I avoid user research fatigue from the customers who are often solicited? Oh, welcome. Welcome to B2B to C. Welcome to SaaS. Welcome to limited customers. Welcome to no access to end users. Welcome to bothering the same customers over and over again. (laughs) I feel you and you are not alone. I have worked at many B2B to C SaaS companies in your same exact position. So I feel you. I have annoyed a lot of people, well, a very few people actually, well, who knows? I have annoyed the same customers, let's say, over and over again. So I totally understand where you're coming from. I can empathize with you. You are not alone. And I always like to remind people there are many other people in your situation or there are many other people who have been in your situation, right? And this one is very near and dear to my heart. I actually love B2B to C. I love SaaS companies. I love doing research. I love doing B2B research. It's my favorite type of research. But I do understand, especially if you are at a company who is in its earlier stages or who doesn't have much access to customers or is reaching out to the same customers because of lack of budget, whatever reason it might be, I totally get the fear and also the anxiety about this kind of situation. So let's go through some ideas to help you in terms of what you can do whenever you are in this particular situation. So let's start with the only having access to 20 customers and the research fatigue. So whenever I was working at one of the first companies that I worked at, Alice, whenever I was working there, we were a B2B. And, oh, I want to say that we had 
at least in New York City, we didn't really do that much remote research. Remote research wasn't really a thing. I also wasn't very good at research at this part of my career, and I really didn't understand the importance of talking to a diversity of users. But to be fair, we didn't have that many users on our platform anyways. But within the context of New York City, I want to say we had maybe about 10 customers. So I f again, I feel you here. And what happened is, of course, we went to do field studies with them. We contacted them. We wanted help understanding them, doing interviews, all of this different type of research because we, of course, again, wanted to understand how to create products that alleviated their pain points and help them achieve their goals and their needs. So with the understanding that we only had 10 people within this context and again i didn't i didn't do that much remote research we had to be really careful about prioritizing research and also understanding what research could be combined if necessary so what does that actually look like if you have 20 customers right and if you want to do a generative research study Ideally, out of those 20 customers, you would be contacting 15 of them for one-on-one -on -one interviews, right? That leaves five extra to do, let's say, a usability test with because it's about five to seven people for a usability test, right? So within the scope of the 20 customers, you have one generative research project and one usability test. So the way that I started thinking about our customer base was based on sample size and projects. And so what we had to do is we had to understand, okay, these are the projects that we want. These are the sample sizes that we need for these projects. And this is our combined total of customers, right? In this case, we had to be so super careful about prioritizing our re research initiatives or making sure that we were being really smart about combining initiatives that were similar enough, but of course, not, not to a point where it would be overwhelming for us or the customer. So that is the first thing that I recommend doing is getting a really clear prioritization process for, for you and your situation that you're in. I do have a prio template, which I'm going to pop into the description, but it's not based on this situation. So it might not be applicable for you, although you can of course change it up. But the way that I went through prioritizing was looking at the projects, looking at the sample size required of the projects and looking at our general customer base and saying, okay, if, if we have three generative research projects and three usability tests, right? So three times 15 is 45 right? So we needed 45 people for those generative research projects. And then we have three usability tests. We need anywhere from about like 15 or to 21 users for those three usability tests. Now, with that in mind, we only have 20 customers, right? And we need about 60 to fulfill all of these in their, in their minimum, right? So to fulfill three generative research uh, projects at 15 each and three usability tests at five each, we need a total of 60 customers. So with that being said, where do we want to prioritize? We have 20, so we can do a third of this, right? Do we want to do one generative and one, one usability test? Could we combine one test to be both generative and evaluative. So can we have some sort of walk the store interview? And I'll pop my article about walk the store interviews in the description, but can we have some sort of hybrid interview that covers both generative and evaluative research? And then we can save customers in that way, right? So what you essentially have to do is play a numbers game and be really, really clear and upfront and understanding about your priorities. And those priorities should still look at what research will be most impactful for teams and the business making better decisions to move forward. Now, when it comes to making sure that you're not talking to your customers too often, this is a bit hard and this is something that you're going to have to gauge actually with your customers. So 
one thing that I, I, let me also say that I created a rolling research program that within these, this customer base that also made it easy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I just wanted to say it out loud because now my brain will remember it. So I'm essentially interrupting myself so that I remember my train of thought. (laughs) So in terms of, in terms of user research fatigue with customers, what I did is I spoke to my customers and I asked them, Hey, how often, how, how often do you feel like we can have conversations? You know, some of them said that they would be up for every month having a conversation with me. Some of them said that it would be closer to every three months. Some of them said it depended on the type of study, right? So I was very upfront and transparent with them because, hey, they were the only people that we had. So I, I, I didn't... I had to be upfront with this. So if you feel comfortable with these customers, maybe asking them how often they feel comfortable with this, with the, with the understanding that this can always change, right? Just because they say that they want to talk to you every month doesn't mean that they're locked into that, right? And I also explained to them, and this was very interesting because it kind of crosses the boundaries a little bit, but I explained to them hey, this is what a one-on-one interview is. This is how much time it generally takes. This is the, I guess, cognitive load behind it. This is a usability test. This is how much time this takes. This is the cognitive load of this. So that they could almost self-select and be like, oh yeah, I'm up for two usability tests, but I hate one-on-one interviews, right? So like we had a really great relationship where we were able to talk these things through through. And I do recommend if you have such a limited customer base to get comfortable having those conversations, because there is no one right answer to user research fatigue and to what what I have called in the past, blacking out participants after a study, right? At companies, I have made it so they can't participate for three months after a study, for one month after a study, for two weeks after a study. It really it really depends on how many customers you have access to. And I would just go straight to them and have these conversations, right? So that you can understand this. So that is, that's my advice in terms of having, having an understanding of what research fatigue could be for them. Um, I would also say that you can, uh, I would give special incentives to some of these customers, especially the ones that sign up for doing research more often for you. So something that we had in terms of some more special customers is that they were entered into certain raffles. They got a care package from us they were they were prioritized so they were almost a bit vip which you know is a bit controversial because of course you don't want to be building for two people or vip clients because that is a whole problem in and of itself but when you're starting with this weird we only have access to a small amount of customers kind of thing. You do want to do something to call out the people who are more willing to talk to you more often. Just make sure you check with your legal team to see what you can and cannot incentivize them with. I know that there are some some rules and regulations around sending like alcohol or sending gift cards or sending food or whatnot, you know? So just be, be, be sure to check with your legal team if you're going to go above and beyond and incentivizing certain customers that are more willing to speak with you. You can also send them swag. You can also give them discounts to your product. You know, you can give them access to beta tests. That's also something that I did with our customers who were willing to talk to us more often. I think out of the 10 or so customers that we had, about three or five of them were more likely to talk to us more often. And I always gave them like access to like things early so that they could kind of rip it apart and we could kind of change it. And and so that's that was really helpful and they felt kind of special, you know? So that is what I would think about in terms of user research fatigue. And now I want to get to the rolling research idea and I will post a link to my rolling research. I think I have an article on it. I also have a guide as well on on rolling research and setting up that program. But 
essentially rolling research is this idea of continuous studies. So having and conducting continuous research studies over time. And rolling research can have specific goals. It can be more open-ended. You can do rolling research for things like personas and journey maps. They just generally take more time. So it's it's a slow burn, right? So for example, when I had limited clients, what we did is every So we did a, we wanted to do a persona study, but we are also had so many other things to talk to our clients about. So over the course of three months, I talked to all 10 customers about, about their day-to-day lives, about their pain points, about their needs, about their goals. And I, over three months, right, spaced out those conversations. And at the end of those three months, I had... 10 interviews that had to do with building our personas, right? But I spaced it out so much because again, we only had these 10 people and we were we were trying to test other things with them. So that's another way to think about it as well. Like if you are trying to do larger scale studies, what you can do is if everybody's okay with it, of course, is, is plan them over a longer period of time, right? So that can also help you with trying to figure out how to prioritize some of these studies and how to fit in larger scale studies. Now, when it comes to just general best practices, uh, when you have this type of situation with fewer customers, the only thing that you have to make sure of is that you're not taking one or two customers and putting them on a pedestal, which is why I said we have to be careful when we offer VIP feedback loops with certain customers because you don't want your organization to get into this habit of only focusing on power users or something of the sort. So that's something that I would just heavily keep in mind and try your best to diversify your conversations with as many of these 20 customers as possible, right? And just really, I whenever I started with these 10 customers, not all of them responded to me right away, but over time, I was slowly able to finagle them into talking to me. So try to continuously reach out to people, of course, unless they tell you, please leave me alone try to continue to diversify your studies as much as you can across these 20 customers because the last thing you want is to build products based on one or two people because it's just simply not going to help you in the long term. Another thing that I would say, which is really helpful and I found extremely helpful once I finally unlocked this part of my career is to recruit customers or people who are using competitor products to understand how they are using those competitor products. And since they are probably going through the same tasks, they will have similar goals, pain points, needs, right? So finding ways to recruit people outside of your customer base, right? So I was, uh, for the job that I'm talking about, I was working in hospitality and we had a platform. And what I did is I found a few competitive platforms and I found forums on Reddit, I think it was, that had people talking about this competitor platform. And I asked people if they would be willing to talk to me about it, right? And I also went to conventions So hospitality conventions and found people there where I could talk to them about the competitor because, again, the roles of the people who were using our platform and the people who were using the competitor's platform were the same, right? So they did have overlaps in their needs, goals, and pain points. So a huge thing that opened my eyes and then opened us up to a wider customer base to get more feedback was looking at competitors and trying to find users of competitor products or users that have the same role as the people that we are talking to but aren't users of our product, right? 
And this is tricky to do. You can look at things like Reddit. You can look at things like Facebook, LinkedIn. It depends on where where you are and what the rules and regulations are about reaching out to people. It's It can be a, a bit difficult. I know the, the, the work that I did for this particular company was in America. So I know that they are much more GDPR lax. So it is easier to reach out to people and find people. But if you're going on some forums, that might be something that could be interesting. You could also see, like, I don't know if your marketing team has any sort of marketing or comms emails, and you could put that go out to a wider base than just these 20 customers, because oftentimes not everybody who's on your marketing list or email list is your customer. So you could also ask your marketing team, hey, is it possible for for us to put something in there where it's like a link to schedule a conversation or some something of the sort where we can ask them to put their email in if they're interested in having a conversation with us and doing research for us. So those are those are some ideas for how you can kind of expand that base. And then finally, the whole uh, no access to end users. I struggled with this a lot too in my B2B2C role. What I had to do was forge really great relationships with the B2B customers. And then what I was able to do eventually was get them to find customers for me to research, which was very odd. I didn't love that. So what I ended up doing was actually a lot of guerrilla research, which also isn't the best. As I said, I struggled with this a lot. So we were a social media platform and what we did was we collated user-generated content for brands to use. So our customers for our platform were brands, but obviously the customers who were then seeing the user-generated content on these brands' websites were people who were buying their products. So it was the B2C part. It was just customers who are doing things like buying makeup or buying furniture or buying clothing or buying anything. So what I had to do was find ways to talk to people who were buying makeup, clothing, et cetera, like with or on websites that had user-generated content. And it didn't have to be from our platform. It could have been any sort of gener- user-generated content. So I... I went out and I did, I was in New York City at the time. So I was able to do a lot of kind of guerrilla research where, and Sephora was one of our clients where I would go into a Sephora and they would actually have user generated content in the Sephora. And people could look at this content and kind of understand how the makeup might look on them. And like there were, there were these kinds of, uh, these kinds of concepts that were happening in, in the stores. And I would talk to people while they were buying things, which Sephora wasn't really pleased about, and I eventually got kicked out, but about their about their experience. So when it comes to having these, getting the the customer part of the B two B two C, you have to be really creative. And one of the best ways to do that is either by just finding people who do these things. Or uh, worst case scenario, which is what we eventually had to do, is go through a recruitment agency to get these customers. So get to get to people who were buying clothing and makeup and all of this stuff online. Because again, my guerrilla research was more in person and there's very limited in-person user generated content. So I, I did run into problems there. So I would, I, I kind of in this, unless you're able to have your clients or your B2B customers give you their customers or give you access to some sort of customer base that they have, it's going to be really hard for you to do that customer part of the B2B to C. Anyways, I hope that those were helpful tips and I look forward to hearing from you if you want to uh, reach out or if anybody else has had this kind of situation and and hopefully these these types of tips are are helpful for you and you can you can utilize them and and put them into practice and and try them out I will, as I said, I will post all of the resources in the description below so that you can go into those. 
And yeah, I hope again that you're having a wonderful day. I can't, apparently I can't say that enough. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to hit subscribe and submit your next question. And I look forward to talking to you all soon. Bye. Thank you.